Thanks, y'all. Sit down. Stop. 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 Look at you. Looking like yourselves. Looking like yourselves. Let's pray. I think all of the teaching, preaching, all of this ought to start with and the lead to prayer. So let's pray together. God, we be tripping. So help us. Amen. Um, I, I really do. Uh, my mom said this to me when I was a, when I was a teenager. The first time I ever preached a sermon, I was 14 years old. And so I'm 32 now. So I've been preaching a long, 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 long time. Uh, more than half my life has been spent uh, talking to people about what God shows me in his word. But my mom said this to me when I was about 16. She said, it will always be easier for you to preach 10 sermons than to live out one. And uh, that has been proven more true than most anything else she's ever said. And so I'm always trying to live in the grace and the conviction of uh, making sure that I don't preach something that feels good but that is actually something that I have lived out in my life. And I don't think that there's any clearer indication for me. This is just me. I don't think there's any clearer indication for myself that I am communicating something that I have lived out. Nothing says that to me more than my wife being willing to come and listen to me. I think if, uh, that was, if I was not teaching y'all something that I've lived out in my life, she would find something else to do and would not be here. She's not wired in a way to lie. She's a horrendous liar. That's why we have a great marriage. Uh, She's always brutally honest. Um, But I never take for granted her presence at all, uh, especially in moments like this, because it is the accountability I need. It's the accountability that's always present in my life for every married person. Your spouse ought to be your greatest level of accountability, ought to be that my spouse will stand next to me and confirm and affirm what what I'm communicating. So thank you for standing and clapping and honoring me but stand up, clap, and honor my wife for being here and her presence being with us today. Y'all ready? This microphone is going to droop lower and lower and lower the longer. I I can tell you right now, it's just going to get worse and worse. And I apologize about that ahead of time. Um, I'm going to try to stay seated in this this stool. We'll see how that goes. I want to talk... I want to talk today... um, about something the Lord recently, uh, a revelation God recently gave me. And guys, this one hurt a little bit. I'm just going to be honest. This one, this one hurt a little bit. Um, and the, the title of this teaching is uh, The Problem with Culture. I want to talk today about the problem with culture. I want to I talk today about the problem with culture. I believe God intends to correct a lot of what is off track as it pertains to culture. And I'm not talking about the culture of the world we live in. If I could be completely honest, um, I don't think God is caught off guard by how sinful the the world is. I really don't. I don't think God is at all shocked at the craziness that happens on the news, the stuff that makes us Take, that takes us back and makes us concerned. I don't think God is worried at all. I think God is much more concerned about the culture that's in his house than the culture that's in the world. And so when we're talking today about the, the problem with culture, I'm not talking about the world. He already gave his son to save this world. So I don't think he's worried about that. I want to talk about the problem with the culture that's in the house of God. Because I do think there are some things that have the potential to be very problematic if we do not address and if we do not make sure that we take on the accountability that we need to take on, to take on the correction that we need to take on, to take on the conviction that we need to take on in order to bring about the kind of culture that I believe God wants for his house. Now, I started saying this phrase when I was leading the U team at UC. I don't know where I got it from, and it's too good to have come out of my brain. Uh, So credit to whoever I heard say this. Um, But you cannot duplicate. You cannot duplicate or defend a culture. You cannot first define. You cannot duplicate or defend a culture. You cannot first define. And I think for so many of us, if somebody were to ask you, what is the culture of the kingdom? I think just as many people are sitting in here you would be able to uh, 
come up with that many different answers. You know what I mean? If I were to ask Cowboys fans, what is the culture of your football team? You would say eight and eight and a loss in the first round of the playoffs. That's our culture. You know what I mean? We'd say choke. I know some of you might be like, well, what's your favorite football team? Don't worry about that. What is the culture of the Dallas Cowboys interceptions in the red zone? And you know what I mean? Is AJ here? What's up, AJ? <laughs> this is that for AJ. I think when we look at some of the other cultures that we're part of, we'll be able to identify pretty quickly. This is the culture. But I think when you start thinking about the culture of the kingdom, specifically the culture of the kingdom at Elevation Church, I think we probably struggle to kind of put together, well, what is the culture? I've heard so many people say, well, the culture's slipping. Oh, the culture's slipping. I've said it before. Man, the culture's slipping. I told somebody recently, the church that hired me and the church I work at are two very different organizations. And I don't know when the change happened, but something something happened. Uh, Pre-COVID Elevation Church and post-COVID Elevation Church feel sometimes like two very different places. And while I have used that as a complaint, God gave me this revelation as a conviction that the problem with the culture is not the people that are in the culture. Oftentimes, the problem with the culture is not the visionary of the culture. The problem is the leaders. I knew I wasn't going to get an amen right there, man. The problem is the leaders, that everything rises and falls on leadership. Everything rises and falls on leadership. So if the culture is falling and failing, it's because the leaders have allowed it to fall and fail. If the culture is slipping, it's because the leaders are slipping. If the culture is becoming diluted, it's because the leaders are becoming diluted. And this revelation that God gave me spoke directly to me and it convicted me for areas in my life I have not taken a stand for the culture of the kingdom. For areas and opportunities in my life that I have not taken a stand for the culture of Elevation Church. Now you build culture with two words. Yes and no. Yes and no are the two words you use to build culture. Yes and no. Some stuff you need to say yes to and some stuff you need to say no to. And when people start going, well, what if instead of e-groups, the answer is no. The answer is no. What if instead of rhythm night, what if, no. Not because it's sinful, not because your idea is bad, but that might be an idea for a different church because over here, uh, here, we exist so that people who are, thank y'all for knowing this, oh my Lord, far from God will be raised to life in Christ. That's why we're doing this. That's, that's what we're up to. And the reason we would invite you to be part of that is so that you can see what God can do through you. That's it. Ain't nothing else. We've gone through seasons of, as a next gen ministry where we had our own defined vision. And I'm thankful for the alignment that God sent to Tim that sent me some conviction down my spine. It was like, yeah, there are two different visions happening. We exist so that people who are far from God are raised to life in Christ. Anybody trying to do something else needs to go somewhere else and do something else. Not because it's bad, not because it's wrong, not because it's sinful. It's just not the way we do what we do here. Culture is the way we carry the vision. That's all culture is. It's the way we carry the vision. And I'm telling you, you got to say yes a little less and no, a lot more. It is easier as a leader to say no and go ask a question and find out you should have said yes and go back and say yes than it is to say yes to something then get clarity and have to come back and say no. Not because we're trying to police the culture, but because we have a responsibility as leaders to progress the culture. Not trying to police it, I'm trying to progress the culture. And now it is not my job to climb the mountain and spend 40 days on a mountaintop with Jesus for him to tell me people far from God raised to life in Christ. But when Moses comes back down the mountain and says that to us, it's our responsibility to carry that out. And when we don't, we have a problematic culture. Someone asked me recently, do you think we probably ought to change our core values? You want to know what I told that person? 
You need to resign. I loving, love you to death. You need to go work somewhere else. How dare you? How dare you question something you did not have the burden to carry? How dare you ask that question? Who are you? What fast did you go on? What work did you do? What sacrifice did your family make in order to get that? Okay, you need to eat the fish and leave the bones because you're choking right now. You can do more by talking less right now in this moment. Okay, God is not at the center. So you have, your, your priorities are not being integrated. I walked through all 10 of them to make sure you understood your pro, this is problematic. This has become problematic. This is the problem with culture is when, when, when a leader can't count on their leaders. This is problematic. And what ends up happening when a culture does not have quality leaders, when a culture does not have enough leaders, here's what happens. Moses says to God in Numbers chapter 11, kill me. Moses says to God in Numbers chapter 11, kill me. This ain't worth it. It's too heavy. You got me out here in this wilderness and these people are asking for food and I don't know where I'm going to get food from. So Moses literally says, I'd rather you just kill me. This is so unfair that I'm carrying this burden by myself. I would rather you just kill me. And God responds to Moses in the most interesting way. Now, I can read, okay? I don't want y'all to think I'm illiterate, but I want us to read these two verses together and any word I don't say is not because I'm struggling to sound it out. I want you to read with me in this manner. Can we go through this? Let's read Numbers chapter 11. Let's start at verse 16. Moses has just said to God in the three previous verses, kill me, this burden is too heavy. I can't do this. I can't find food for all these people. This is too much. It's too heavy. It's too much. It's too heavy. It's too much. Too heavy. I would rather die than to keep doing this. And this is what God says to Moses. Numbers chapter 11, verse 16. Then the Lord said to Moses, gather for me 70 men of the elders of Israel who you know to be elders of the people and officers and to the tent of meeting and let me take their stand there with you. Verse 17. And I will come down and talk with you there. Listen, I will come down and talk with and I will take some of the that is on and put it on and they shall bear the burden of the with you so that you may not bear it yourself alone. Moses says, this is too much. I cannot carry this. This is too much. I cannot do this. I would rather die than try. This is how you know you don't have enough ministry partners. When your prayer changes to, I would rather die than try. This is how you know you need some more people around you. When your prayer changes to, I would rather die than try. This is too heavy for me. Moses is telling God, this is too heavy for me. This is too heavy for me. But God says, verse 16, this is what God says to Moses. Gather for, gather for, Moses is saying, but God, me, me, me. And God says, no, 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 gather for me. Moses says, God, I need help. But then God says, go get some people for me. Not for you. Don't go get them for you. Go get them for me. Because if you get them for you, you're going to take that suicidal spirit that's on you and you'll multiply that onto them. But if you bring them to me, King James Version doesn't say, I'll put the spirit that's on you. King James Version says, I'll take some of the power that's on you and put it on them. And when you are in an unhealthy season, you will always multiply your unhealthy spirit on the leaders that are around you. This is why God says, bring me, gather for me 70 men of elders. Now, this word gather is an interesting word, Shu. Because the word gather suggests that what Moses needs, he has always had. It has just been scattered. 
He doesn't go say develop leaders. He doesn't go say discover leaders. He says, gather for me 70 of the men of, of elders of Israel who you know to be elders of the people. The NIV says, who you know to already lead well. You already, they're already leaders. But I get where Moses is coming from. They're in the wilderness. It's at least 2 million people out there. But at this point, they have multiplied in the wilderness. So there could be anywhere from 2 to 5 million people. And God is like, fine, 70. He's like, where, how? 70 out of 3 million. What are you talking about? Have you ever stood in the lobby at your campus looking for one new leader? And 300 people walk through the door. You're like, where in the world am I going to find the one person that I'm looking for right now? God says, gather. You already have them. They're just scattered right now. They're already amongst you. You just need to gather them. And once you gather for me, people who you know that are already leaders, people who you know are already elders. So God speaks, leadership is just influence. Elders is age. God says, I need you to get some influential people that the people like, but I need you to have enough wisdom as a leader to understand you need to get some older people. They're not as cool, but they're effective. Get me leaders and elders and bring them to me. Get me leaders and elders, gather them, and then bring them. Don't bring them one by one. Gather them first. They're scattered, so I need you to put them together. But then this next action step is to bring them to the tent. They're scattered, so I need you to get them together. But now I need you to take them from a neutral or a hidden place, and I need you to bring them into purpose. I wonder, am I talking to anybody who knows what it feels like to be scattered in a neutral place, in a hidden place that nobody sees you and nobody knows you're there? And then one random day, God tells Moses, get them together and then bring them out of the hiding. Bring them out of the whispers of the two or three because they're already leading amongst the people. So the people around them already know who they are. But now I need you to make an announcement by bringing them to the tent. Don't bring them in the tent. Bring them to the tent. Scatter first, so I need you to gather first. Then the next thing I need you to do is to bring them. They're scattered, so I need you to get them together, and then I need them to come out of that neutral place, and I need them to step into purpose. You stand, You with me so far? Bring them to the tent of meeting, and then let them take their seat. Let them lay down and get comfortable. Let them choose which role they're going to do. Let them work in their preference. No, let them take their. You will never find a miracle in the Bible that Jesus did for somebody sitting down. They were either standing and he commanded them, come here, or he went to them because they didn't have the ability to come to him. But being seated is this posture that I'm finished. That's why Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. I've done the work. But you won't find a miracle that he does for anybody in the Bible that they're sitting down. He will always say, come here. I know you're blind, but come here. I know your hand is withered, but come here. Lazarus, I know you're dead, but come here. You at the gate called beautiful, I'll come to you. You buy the water, but you can't get into it, I'll come to you. Mary and Martha, I'll come to you. But nowhere does he do a miracle for somebody who's sitting down. Because he's saying, if you got the ability to come to me, come to me. And if you don't, I am the kind of God that will come to you. What I will not do is interrupt your convenience. What I will not do is compete with your comfortability. So don't bring them to the tent and sit them down. Bring them to the tent and let them stand. Because when you stand, you are communicating to God, I am ready for whatever you're going to do. When you take the position of standing, Lord, no matter what you're going to do, I'm ready to do it. Chubby, do me a favor. Go stand right over there. All right? He doesn't know I'm getting ready to do this exercise with him. He found out right now that we're getting ready to do this exercise. But I want you to watch this, okay? Because I want you to understand what, that your posture is communicating to God. 
I need you to understand that your posture is communicating to God. You ready? Ready? Set? He has no idea that I'm getting ready to tell him to do something. But if I told Chuby to run and he's sitting down, there's some confusion. Run where? Go where? How far? How long? But once he got in position, show me verse 17. Once he got in position, stay right there. Once they're standing at the tent, then I will come down and talk. So then this makes me ask this question. If we're waiting on God to show up and say something to us, there stands a chance that God is waiting for us to get in position. Thank you so much for the illustration, Juby. I know you want to take some notes. (laughs) Once you gather them, they're scattered. Bring them to the tent. Give them some purpose. Once y'all are all standing there, then I will come down and talk with you. Then I'll come down and talk. But I will not come down and talk until the leaders get in position. I will not descend my spirit until the leaders are ready for it. I will not show up until the leaders are ready for me to show up. I have nothing to say until y'all get set. And if we are experiencing seasons of slippage, if we are experiencing seizing of sliding, we've got to ask ourselves, not Pastor Stephen, we've got to ask ourselves, not God, we've got to ask ourselves, not Tim, are we standing and ready? If we feel like God hasn't given us a fresh word for new direction, then we've got to figure out for ourselves, are we standing? God's not talking to Moses. He said, bring them to the tent, but tell them to stand. And once they're standing, then I will come. Now listen to how petty God is. You ready? Bring them to the tent. Have them take their stand there. And I will come down and talk with. The whole group. Special word for everybody. Unique prophecy for each unique person. God is having a one-on-one conversation with Moses. Bring them to the tent and then I'm going to talk to you, Moses. Moses. I'll come talk to you there. And if me and you talk for two days, the responsibility of the people you brought to the tent is to do what? Stand. I'll tell you what the problem of the culture is. Too many people are getting tired way too soon. You won't stand long enough. Listen to me, family. This ain't something I'm preaching that sounds pretty. I know what it's like to stand through some difficult situations. I know what it's like to stand on integrity. I know what it's like that when people are saying lies about me, I don't have to respond with a lie about them. I could tell the truth about you. But instead, I'm going to stand on integrity. I'm going to stand on honor. And no matter what you do, I'm going to stand. I will not stoop down to your level. Enough with leaders who stoop. My father used to say it like this. When you stoop, You look stupid. (laughs) But if you are a leader, it don't say bring them to the tent so they can stoop down to the level of the people they lead. So they can stoop down to the comment sections and defend Pastor Stephen's sermons. So they can stoop down to the level of going back and forth about whether Mike Todd should come or not. So they can stoop down and talk about stuff they ain't got no business talking about. No, bring them to the tent and stand. Shut your mouth and stand. That's leadership. Bring them to the tent so they can stand. And I'll come down and talk to you there. And I will take, this is God talking. God says, I will take some of the spirit. King James NIV says, I'll take some of the power. I'll take some of the spirit. I'll take some of the power that's on you. And I will put it on them. I will take some of the spirit that's on Moses, and I will put it on them. Once they're standing, they were scattered, but you gathered them. They were hidden, but then you brought them to the tent so everybody could see, so you could see, so they could see, so I could see. And now they're standing. Now they're ready. Now I'll take some of the spirit that's on you, Moses, and I'll put it on them so that they can help bear some of the influence 
so they can bear some of the authority. I got one note. So they can bear some of the clout. So that they can bear some of the positions, titles, opportunities. Here's the problem with lead, here's the problem with culture. Way too many leaders trying to bear clout. Way too many leaders trying to bear influence. Way too many leaders trying to bear blessings when the whole time God called for leaders was so that they could bear. Are y'all reading this too? I'm not making this up. This is what the Bible says. So that they can bear the burden of the people with you. I'm taking power off of Moses and putting it on people. I'm taking the power off of Pastor Stephen and I'm putting it on the staff. Now so they can have as many followers, as much money. But I'm bringing leaders to the tent so that they can share with Moses the, the burden of the people so that you don't have to bear it by yourself. God doesn't even address Moses' suicidal rant because God realizes you're only saying that because you don't have people to bear this with you. But if I could give Moses the right people, if I give Moses the right people to bear the burden of the people, if I can get him the right leaders to share with him in this burden, I could get these people to their promise sooner. So then here's the question every leader in the room needs to answer. What was the last burden you lifted off of somebody? What was the last burden you... Not, I took care of everything that was on Asana. That's not what I asked you. That's you doing your job. I'm not talking about that. I said, what was the last burden you lifted off of the people? Because you got to understand, Moses gets 70 men. These men are builders. These men are cooks. These men help their community function. Somebody got to build the houses. Somebody got to keep them up. Somebody got to meet. These men got jobs. So we're not talking about your job. But after you've done your job, what burden have you lifted? Your job needs to, this is the expectation of leadership, that you would do your job and lift the burden. But if you're struggling to just do your job, then my question is, do you really have the spirit of the house on you? Do you really have the spirit of the house on you? The spirit of the house is marked by the burden of the people. The spirit of this house was marked by eight families selling their houses, moving to a city for, to launch a church they didn't even know the name of yet, sacrificing everything, never having the promise of a paycheck, just to lift burden. Some of them committed, I'll be a missionary for this church for the rest of my life if that's what I have to do, just to lift the burden. How dare you walk through here and say you're not getting paid enough? How dare you walk through here and say, by now, I should have. If that's the posture of your heart, you don't have the spirit of the house. Pastor Stephen didn't give me the authority to say this, but I'm going to take it anyway. Leave. I love you, but leave. Not because you need to be a slave to Elevation Church. Not because you need to be mistreated in the name of working on staff. Not because you don't need to be valued at the right level. But the reason you got bought to the tent was not to get paid. The reason you got bought to the tent was not to get paid. It was not about a position. It was about you lifting burden. It's about lifting the burden of the people. Can I help some of you in the room? If you never show up at a campus, you cannot lift the burden. If you never show up where the people are, you'll never be able to lift their burden. Because burden lifting, burden lifting requires proximity. But if I work at Central and I'll have to be at a campus, and you can't tell me to be at a campus, and it's unfair that I have to go serve because I work here and I don't work at a campus, if that's your posture, that's fine. You need to go somewhere else. You don't have the spirit of this house. Not this house. Because at this house, 
we lift the burden off the people. And anybody who's in a leadership space but does not lift the burden pushes burden down on people. And the last thing the kingdom of God needs and the last thing Elevation Church needs, I don't know if y'all can be able to post this on YouTube. This might be an in-the-house joint. That's for Tim to decide later. The last thing our church needs is a bunch of people with the title of leader who put more burden on people than they walk through the door with. Enough of that. We could eliminate church hurt if leaders would just lift burden. If you would just lift the burden, we could eliminate half the trauma people are experiencing in the space of their faith if you would just lift the burden. If you can go an entire week and not talk about somebody who's not on your Asana task list, you have not lifted a burden. This is the reason why Moses brings the leaders to the tent. This is why if we are waiting around for Pastor Stephen to preach another sermon and write another song to give us something to do, you have not lifted the burden. Enough. I would rather have 70 people in a nation of 3 million than to have 400 staff and half of y'all ain't going to do nothing. I would just rather that be the case. The responsibility of every leader is to lift the burden of the people. It is to lift the burden of the people. Here's my holy frustration, is that when I get picked up to be one of the 70, I'm super excited about that. I will post that I got hired at Elevation Church. And you're going to get my journey, and I'm going to make it a real and I'm going to play an Elevation song in the background, and it's going to be a whole three minutes telling you how I got to this place. A whole lot of stuff that I'm one of the people who got the spirit on them. I'm one of the ones who got selected. It's just not a lot of posts about, yeah, I'm one of the people who are consistently lifting burden. Can you lift burden without being celebrated? Can you lift burden without getting recognized? Can you stand up and applaud people who have done you wrong when they get recognized? Do you have the maturity to stand up and applaud people who have done you wrong in moments that they are being recognized for a burden that they've lifted? Or has bitterness set in so deep into your heart that the only thing coming out of your mouth is critique and criticism? That the only thing flowing out of your spirit is not questions, but the questioning spirit, the kind of spirit that says, did God really say, did we really get this guest to come in? Did Tim really decide to use this person for a video? Did that person really get a promotion? Not asking questions, but it's a questioning spirit that uses questions to make statements, that uses questions to sow discord, that uses questions to birth doubt in minds of others. If that's the posture you're in, I'm not here to beat up on you. I'm just here to tell you this. Here, the leaders live burdens. And if not, I would invite you to go be a leader somewhere else. But if you're going to be here, we have got to get the problematic part of our culture under control. And every other thing we could look at and point and say, that is a problem in our culture, I could probably agree with you. But underneath the surface, there is a leader not lifting burden, period. There is a leader not lifting burden. What I love about this verse is that Moses does not assign any of these 70 people to any other group of people. All 70 of these men get assigned to the nation. Can I tell you what I'm sick of hearing? Oh, that's not my team. I hope this blesses somebody on YouTube. But if I hear one more person say, well, we're youth, not e-kids. But this group of leaders have been brought together to lead the nation of next gen. Yeah. So if that means you need to get your behind in the e-kids video, shut up, go to the tent and stand and let the spirit get on you, okay? Yeah. If that means you need to jump on a podcast, you need to do whatever. If they need you to hold a light up, if that's going to lift the burden off of somebody, that's what you need to do. That's what leadership is. Yeah. And the problem with our culture 
The problem with the culture in the kingdom, we got way too many leaders who are not lifting burden. Way too many leaders who are not lifting burden. And if we don't lift burden in the kingdom of God, and we think God is going to sit back and just let that happen, you don't know the God of the Bible. If you won't lift the burden, here's what you need to understand. You are refusing to help a jealous man's bride. And at some point, that jealous man will show up. Me and my wife let our kids know all the time that we love them unconditionally. But out of our love is the overflow of your life. So please don't ever get it mistaken. I love your mother way more than I will ever love you. And y'all will grow up and fall in love with some other people. And I might not even like the people you fall in love with, but I'm gonna have to live with her for the rest of my life. So there is a priority that's been set in place. I love the people of my house, but my house exists so that my bride has a place to be. And when my wife calls me from work and tells me that the kids have not done their chores and they have not done their homework and they're up and down the steps running and they have broken something, all I hear is that they have not lifted burden. And I don't show up with grace. When I come home, I do not come home with grace. It is, I do not come home with compassion. I come home, my number one priority is to protect my bride. And if I am flawed, if I am jacked up, if I am messed up, and my bride is flawed, and my bride is jacked up, and my bride is messed up, how much more does a perfect God with no flaw, with no blemish. Look, he has even given us a clue in his word. He's coming back looking for his bride with no blemish. Spotless is how he expects to find her. And if you think you can be around the bride of a jealous man and not lift burden, you don't know God for real. You don't know God for real. This is as much a teaching as it is a warning to every leader in the room, to every leader who will watch this later. Your responsibility is to lift the burden of the people. If you're not going to do that, get out of the way. Let somebody else do it who will. Not because we are Arrogant Elevation Church and it'd be a privilege for anybody to work, but because this is the bride of Jesus Christ. That's why. That's why it matters. That's why it matters. We exist so that people who are far from God will be raised to life in Christ. And the invitation we extend to everybody is come here so you can see what God will do through you. But if the leaders are not going to lift the burden, you need to get out the way. That is the problem with culture. Here's my challenge to you. You have got to ask yourself on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly basis, what burden have I lifted? After I've done my job, what burden have I lifted? If there is not an obvious burden, I have not lifted burden. I need to go find one. I need to find something to do. Some of y'all have been in meetings that I have invited myself to. Not because I'm bored and don't have nothing else to do. I just want to make sure I need to be around a burden. Who can we be helping right now? Our responsibility is to not share in the influence. Not to share in the influence. If I see one more person got Elevation Church, a job title at Elevation Church in their bio and hasn't lifted a burden, I'm going to scream. Our responsibility as leaders is to lift the burden of the people. And you've got to be around the people in order to be able to lift their burdens. And if we don't do that as leaders, I don't know if you've noticed, there isn't a problem with the songs. Songs are doing okay. Not a problem with the books. The books are doing all right. Millions of copies sold all over the world for each one of them. No problem with the sermons. They're better than they've ever been. The problem with the culture is the leaders. But God put the spirit of Moses, that's on Moses. He took it off of him, some of it. And he put that same power on the leaders so that they would share the burden of the people. To share the burden of the people. If that's not what you're here for, you need to go somewhere else. God, thank you for this moment. But Lord, more than a cool note to write down a one-liner or a phrase, Lord, bring some of us back to standing in front of that tent again, God. Some of us need a fresh spirit that's on this house to be put on us 
so that we would always be reminded, that, so that we would always be reminded that you brought us here so that we would lift the burden of your people. Let us never forget that you brought us here so that we would lift the burden of your people. God, we really, really, really do be tripping. So help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.